Is there anything else that we're missing uh, from some of these foods, eggs or red meat, that might make them things that we need to pay attention to or watch out for? Or is it mainly the fact that they can be super uh, calorically dense? I do know that like steak has like iron and Mm -hmm. maybe men need to pay a little more attention to that. But is there any other drivers of heart disease within red meat or is it mainly just the fact that it's it's accompanied by a, a large chunk of saturated fat? I think saturated fat is considered the primary mechanism. But heme iron, certainly there are associations with increased heme iron intake and higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And we're just talking about cardiovascular disease here. There are mechanisms outside of saturated fat, for example, where red meat at a certain exposure level is associated with certain types of cancer. Um, and that could be that could be heme iron that is implicated there, or it could be um, other compounds that are produced if you're barbecuing or charring meat, um, nitrates and, and nitrites. So I think we have to be careful not being super, super reductionist and saying it's just all about the saturated fat. This is important and it helps us get one biomarker to go. But we also have to zoom out and look at um, epidemiology studies that are longer term, looking at health outcomes, looking at substitution analyses when we're comparing the consumption of unprocessed red meat versus other foods. What what are the typical outcomes that people are experiencing? And in that, appreciating the exposure amount because the dose seems to make a, a really um, – or play a really big role here. And Alan Flanagan, you've, have you had him on the show? I've had, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so he, he has a blog on Sigma Nutrition called Red Meat and Health. I think it's the, the best, clearest breakdown mm-hmm. on this topic that essentially goes through like why is there all these different camps, some saying that red meat's not a problem and then others saying that red meat, you know, a little tiny bit of red meat's going to kill you. <laughs> and And really it comes down to the exposure and when you're comparing high and low what are you actually comparing so there are plenty of studies looking in asian populations for example where high and low because their high intake's not actually that high you know high and low you might be comparing 80 grams a day versus 40 and both of these are beneath the sort of threshold that we would say is associated with risk if you're talking about unprocessed red meat Mm. but then when you start looking at some of the u.s cohorts and you're comparing intakes sort of north of 100, 130 grams a day with people at 40 grams a day, you, you do see increased risk. So understanding the contrast exposure in studies when you're looking at high versus low is, is really important in terms of making sense of this literature. Otherwise, you can just be led to believe it's kind of all over the place. Mm. So I just wanted to correct. So it was my my total cholesterol was one ninety seven. My LDL cholesterol was one thirty four. Right. Um, are are these things I should still be concerned with if I'm not gaining weight, I'm not overeating, and I am still active and I feel good? Yes. Let me read out a quote from Lauren Cordain. Have you heard of him? I have not. No. He wrote. I think he wrote the first paleo diet book. Oh, cool. So he's a paleo dude. Uh, big proponent of of the paleo diet, obviously, and this kind of speaks directly to your question. So the average total cholesterol level in American adults today is 208 milligrams per deciliter. It's pretty close to yours. Mm -hmm. Uh, Corresponding to an LDL of approximately 130 milligrams per deciliter. (laughs) I think they just ran the test on me. (laughs) We we didn't, this is not set up. We didn't didn't discuss this. Uh, In this case, average is not normal because atherosclerosis is present in up to 40 to 50% of women and men by age 50. Atherosclerosis is endemic in our population in part because the average person's LDL level is approximately twice the normal physiologic level. And there's a, I'll show you that graph there. That's Mm. from a study called the PISA study. And so this um, group of researchers went out and looked at 1,400 people with um, low cardiovascular disease risk profiles but varying LDL cholesterols. So they wanted to see in in a sort of quote-unquote healthy population, if you have these other things in range, blood glucose, inflammation, um, you're not insulin resistant, you don't have diabetes, do we see different amounts of plaque in arteries based on imaging uh, at different levels of LDL cholesterol exposure? 
And they specifically actually wanted to look at what happens at quote unquote normal LDL cholesterol, which people may say is, you know, 100 and 100 to 120 milligrams per deciliter or some people may say 130 milligrams per deciliter, which is around where you are. And at that level, people without other cardiovascular disease risk factors, over 50% of them had subclinical atherosclerosis. So that you're laying down plaque. That's the key point here. If you're above 70 milligrams per deciliter of LDL, which is about 80 milligrams per deciliter APOB, um, then you will be laying down plaque. Now, how much that raises your risk? Sure, if, if you're someone with diabetes or you have systemic inflammation, that's kind of you know, pouring fuel <laughs> on the flame, but it's the LDL cholesterol, the APOB, that's sparking that flame in the first place. Mm. Um, so you certainly at 120, 130, I would want to act on that and, and push that down more towards goal. And maybe your first starting point is going and measuring campesterol and uh, uh, cytosterol these, those phytosterols to see if you're a hyperabsorber. Mm. And you even if you're not, you can then just rule that out and know that, okay, I should focus more on lowering saturated fat. I should eat more polyunsaturated fats because they do the opposite of, of, of saturated mm. fat. They actually upregulate those LDL receptors. So they're going out and recruiting those crane drivers and sending more of them to work and you're clearing it better. And then more fiber. So fiber will actually help bind up some of that bile mm -hmm. um, this is actually speaks to your earlier question. What you, what else can you do about it? Fiber will bind up bile and helps you, you, you excrete it through uh, when you go to the bathroom. And so the response to that is the liver says, "Hey, we need more bile. If it needs more bile, it upregulates the LDL receptor, pulls that cholesterol in, and the net result is ApoB comes down. That's why adding more fiber to the diet is beneficial from a lipid." Um, point of view interesting yeah I, I don't consume pretty much like any fiber at least on purpose of any kind um so that's definitely something i could easily do um you mentioned polyunsaturated fats can you please just give some examples of some like easy things that people can consume fatty fish uh, so let's say salmon or mackerel or sardines if people eat seafood uh, outside of of that there's um, nuts and seeds tofu olive oil Olive oil has a little bit, but it has a lot of monounsaturated fats. It's a great oil. Um, and monounsaturated fats are a step in the right direction from saturated fat for sure. Mm -hmm. But the biggest effect that you get is swapping saturated fats for polyunsaturated fats. And there was a huge meta-analysis back in 1997 that looked at 395 clinical trials, metabolic <coughs> ward, where you lock people up and feed them different fats and see the effect it has on their cholesterol levels. Mm. And that's where we get a lot of that information and sort of understanding um, from. And we know that the, from those studies, we know that saturated fat raises ApoB or LDL cholesterol twice as much on a per gram basis as polyunsaturated fat lowers it. Um, but certainly that's that's the the most impactful swap that someone can make is swapping that type of fat that they're eating. I don't really care about total fat too much. Mm -hmm. I think this discussion around low fat diets um, is problematic. It's a distraction from what matters. What matters is the quality of the fat that you're eating. And if anything, you don't really want a low total fat <laughs> diet. People who have good cardiovascular health they're not adopting a low total fat diet. They have plenty of fat in their diet. It's just that they have a bias to these polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. And there is always saturated fats in the diet. Mm. It's not poison, <laughs> but the dose matters. And when you're getting it sort of usually for the average person below 10% of calories, 8% 8, 8 of calories, 8, 8 to 10, depending on the person, you'll get ApoB more towards that mm. level that we want to. I have a quick okay. question about the epidemiology studies that you were talking about before. And I'm curious how, I guess, you go about interpreting some of it because, you know, a lot of people have talked recently about how they've taken out or they've been able to take out some of the factors like, you know, much of these red meat eaters end up being like smokers. They're not as active. They live sedentary lifestyles. And these factors weren't necessarily added into that increased fat cancer risk. You know, there, it could be the aspect of the lifestyle factors and the eating of processed and unprocessed red meat in this group of people versus this group of people who doesn't tend to eat red meat, they eat more vegetables, they eat more fiber, and they also tend to be more active, et cetera. When people 
talk about those things, they say, okay, red meat causes colorectal cancer, increased risk or increased risk of cancer in general without removing those factors. But when those factors are removed, you see that if there is an increase, it's potentially negligible. Is how, how should people kind of look at that? Because there seems to be a lot of people that are still putting forward that red meat equals increased cancer risk. Mm. I would like to see the studies where that people would point to saying that there was no adjustment. So any of the studies that I'm speaking about and, and when I refer to Alan Flanagan's piece, mm -hmm. uh, those cohort studies do use what's called a multivariate analysis. And you know, nutrition scientists that are working in epidemiology are aware that that is one of, there's limitations of all different types of study designs and that's certainly a limitation of observational research. Yeah. Are there other factors at play here that might be impacting or explaining that association? Um, so they know that and they work really, really hard to collect information on other aspects of these people's lives, whether it is smoking or how much exercise they do or alcohol c consumption. And the, the good studies are not just looking at yes, no, they're actually looking at how much alcohol, how much exercise in, in minutes, um, you know, what number of serves of fruits and vegetables is someone having, how much fiber, et cetera, and then using a multivariate analysis to adjust for that. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not going to be perfect. But when we see r results that are replicated um, across different cohorts, um, looking at the same thing, and then when we look at meta-analyses, and these studies have used multivariate analyses and adjusted for the things that we think that matter, mm -hmm. I don't think that we can simply ignore that and sort of say, well, that's a, it's a healthy user bias. It's an important piece of information. But also remember, we're not just looking at that and saying, okay, red meat's off the menu. We're, we're looking at bench science, mechanistic studies, preclinical studies. We're looking at those um, ob observa observational studies which allow us to look at things over a much longer drawn out time. It's very hard to look at hard health outcomes like cancer and cardiovascular disease in a short-term trial. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the short-term trials. What are the kind of more acute changes to biomarkers that we might care about? And we're looking for converging lines of evidence. And that's how like the, the, the dietary guidelines and uh, the American Heart Association guidelines are coming to their recommendations. And I think Stan, he brought up the, the guidelines. I wanted to read out one uh, important sort of um, sentence in the 2021 dietary guidance to improve cardiovascular health. And this was a scientific statement from the American Heart Association. It's had Frank Sachs and a number of other really reputable nutrition scientists involved in the committee. And they, they specifically say, which comes back to kind of the start of this conversation, and I guess the video that, that I made, which you, mm -hmm. you played in the last episode, um, they say to choose healthy sources of protein, mostly protein from plants, legumes and nuts. And that's kind of what my core message is for people, that when you shift from animal protein to plant protein, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. Right now, the average person is getting 75% of their protein from animal foods. And the average person in this country's LDL cholesterol is at 120 to 130. They're laying down plaque in their arteries. We have a proven method to help them shift that potent risk factor in the right direction and, and reduce that plaque so that they have lower risk of having a, a cardiovascular event. Um, so I think that instead of having 75% of your protein coming from animal foods, if you can shift that and go 50-50 or 25-75, you're going to start to see improvements in your lipid profile and, and your overall cardiovascular disease risk.